Good afternoon, everyone. The Northwest Airlines History Center, uh, something I didn't know anything about, but I happened to walk in there a few years ago, and I thought it was very interesting. And um, so I asked the executive director if he made presentations. I thought you would also find it interesting. And he said, no, we're, we're kind of quiet about that. And uh, so it took me a while to work him up to this presentation. This will be a major event for our speaker today, Bruce Kitt. But Bruce has been to Rotary. He was here a few weeks ago when I introduced him. So he's familiar with our friendly faces and it'll be, a, it'll be an enjoyable program. Bruce lives in Eden Prairie, married, has three children. He worked for Northwest Airlines for 26 years as a mechanic, and he volunteers his time since the center opened in 2002, about 14 years ago now. He and others uh, operate on a volunteer basis the Northwest Airlines History Center, where we will learn all about our favorite airline, the Red Tail Airline, which went away. But some of us like to live in the past, and we'll be delighted to go back to those wonderful days with Northwest Airlines. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce to you Bruce Kitt, the Executive Director of the Northwest Airlines History Center. Well, good afternoon, and I, I thank Jim Lucas for bringing me out of my shell, kind of my coming out party, and I appreciate the Rotarians asking me to come and entertain you. So the good news is, as Jim said, I'm a retired aircraft mechanic. That's good for you because if I had been a flight attendant, we'd have to go through some type of a mandatory emergency drills. I'd be pointing down, asking you to turn around. We can dispense with all of that, thank goodness. So uh, I just want to, there's a lot to tell. And it's hard to condense 84 years of history into a 20-minute presentation. I know you probably have something that you want me to tell you about, so I decided I'd just preempt you, and I'll tell you a sliver of the history of Northwest's 84 years. But just basically so you can see, uh, Northwest Airways, when it first began, was Minnesota's first hometown airline. And there have been a succession of them since then. There's one now currently saying they are but don't believe everything you read because when, you, when you're here first, you get to claim the, the title. But Northwest began in October of 1926. I ran it up to 1934. Those of you that may be familiar with politics, there was a change of administration. The incoming said the outgoing was inept, corrupt, and all that. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt canceled all the airmail contracts, said the Army Air Corps was up to flying the mail that uh, that's how it was going to be run. Uh, after three months and about 14 deaths and 30 some odd crashes, they decided, well, maybe this is something that should go back to the airlines. It did went back to uh, commercial aviation with the stipulation that any of the companies that had been previously involved were ineligible to participate in the new bidding process and any of the officers that were also involved were exempt or dis dissuaded from participating again. So you see Northwest did what many of the other airlines did. Northwest Airways became Northwest Airlines, American Airways became American Airlines, Boeing United Air Transport became United Airlines. We all did it. So it, it was a broad brush. It worked. The mails went back to commercial operation, and as they say, the rest is history, up until, as far as I'm concerned, October of 2008, when some people came from down south and said, we bought your company. And so no, Northwest lost its independence, its operating independence, in October of 2008, and then it took two years to merge all the operations together. So basically, 2008 to 2010 is what I call the fade to black, fade to history, and we were gone. So what story to tell? 
of all the stories that are there, you can pick any year, you can pick almost anything, and I'm sure each of you has a story. The one I like to tell is how it all began. In a quick nutshell, the post office flew the airmail from 1918 to 1925. In 1925, some businesses said, well, the government shouldn't be doing this. This should be opened up to competitive bidding. So the, the post office announced they were getting out of the business, threw it open to competitive bidding, and this individual on the right, I understand I got a pointer here, there we go, this old geezer here, they, they, his name is Charles Dickens, they called him Pop. They also referred to him as Santa Claus, but I like him because he was a very avid aviation booster. He was very instrumental in the Illinois Aeronautics Club, um, had a long history of involvement with heavier than air, air airplanes and ventures. He bid on the contract, as you can see, in October. In January of 1926, the post office says, you won. It was a fierce competition. Oh, no, you were the only bidder. You won. <laughs> in June of 1926, he began his inaugural flight. The first flight out of Minneapolis, the pilot crashed, was killed. The mail was put on a train sent down to Chicago. By mid-August, well, he started with five airplanes and about six or seven pilots. By mid-August, he was down to one airplane, two, mechan or two pilots, and they said, mm -mm, this isn't going to work. So as required by the bidding process, he notified the post office that he was going to surrender the contract <clears throat> and get out of the business. Well, one man's loss is another man's gain, and this individual, Colonel Lewis Hotchkiss Britton, was a very avid civic booster uh, with the St. Paul Association. I have a feeling he was a supporter of Pop Dickens because getting airmail to the frozen Northwest was, was a big deal for both civic pride and necessity. He decided, okay, I'm going to pick this up. Well, he had been an instrumental in working with the Ford Motor Company, had gotten their chief engineer, a man named William Mayo, not related to the Rochester group, to come out, take a look at a site in Highland Park, and said, you know, the other neat thing about this location is there's this little island down below on the bluffs. You guys can put your own powerhouse, build your own powerhouse. You wouldn't have to pay for any electricity. Sold, sold the deal to the Ford Motor Company. He had contacts. He went to Detroit, and he said, hey, guys, can you, can you bankroll us? So uh, Mayo, William Stout, who was uh, credited with being the inventor of the Ford Tri-Motor, they all got together, ponied up the money, and on October, well, on September 7th, Northwest was reawarded CAM 9, which, is, which stands for Contract Air, Air Mail Route 9. And then on October 1st, the first flight was launched, and you know the rest is history, as they like to say, up until, as I like to say, 2008. So I just want to also give credit because uh, Minnesota, I'm not from Minnesota, so I can say this, and it's an outside affirmation of, of some of your traits. You're very loyal. And the people that work for North Central and Republic have a huge following, and I do want to acknowledge everything they, they contributed. They are, they are North, or, uh, Minnesota's second hometown airline. They moved from Wisconsin in 1952. As you can see, in 1979, the North Central merged with Southern Airways, became Republic. They were highly successful. Northwest bought them in 86. So it's a little fish eat, or big fish eat little fish. So this is roughly our 84-year history. I'm going to skip over a lot of fascinating details unless you have questions later, but this is just a snippet of some of the artifacts that we have on display currently in our museum. Um, we represent, we tell the history of 13 other airlines that are part of Northwest's corporate family tree. All of, all of, 12 of them came through the Republic merger. Northwest was rather unique that it never merged with another airline up until 1986, whereas Republic, as I just said, was a joining of North Central and Southern. They bought 
uh, Hughes Air West a year later, which was an amalgamation of West Coast-based airlines. We are the ones that want to tell the story of those airlines and their history as Republic Airlines and as Northwest's history. So we have a lot of items on display. The, you, the museum is unique in that it, Northwest never had a corporate archives. They never had a museum. Uh, they were very, again, I'm not from here, and I, again, it's an affirmation of a trait of uh, the people up here. They had a very Scandinavian Lutheran outlook on things, that they were very frugal, that if they bought anything, Joe used it for whatever purpose it was purchased. He would give it to Tom, who would use it, who would pass it on down the line, till somebody got something that was just tattered and they couldn't use it, it was thrown away. So when Northwest ceased to exist in 2008, Delta went through the quote-unquote archives, which we were jokingly told was just a room that people would timidly come down to, crack the door open, throw something in, slam it real fast, and walk away whistling in the dark. <laughs> Delta came down, bought the company. They went through. They took what they wanted for their financial and fiduciary records, also for their museum. Then they turned around and offered it to the Minnesota Historical Society, and then with everything that was left in that dark room, they said, hmm, let's call the NWA History Center. We got a call one day, said that we have all this stuff. If you're interested in it, it has to be out of here in 24 hours. We quickly rented a couple of U-Haul uh, vans, went over to the Northwest headquarters in Egan, spent a day just we didn't care, we didn't sort, we just, we took it all. Brought it back to our museum. Uh, at that time, we were in the lower level of the Wings Financial Credit Union on 34th Avenue South, if anyone's familiar with it. And they, they owned the, Wings owned the building for a number of years. They were never able to rent out the fourth floor, so we squatted up there for a year as we kind of sorted out the, this bounty of riches and kind of put it in some kind of organizational order to be polite. Um, so what we have though primarily are artifacts that are donated by the individuals. There was, we, we received no support from the company either acknowledgement or monetary. Um, so everything that we got were, were things that were important to the individuals for various reasons whether it was a personal award, a uniform they wore, uh, a freebie when there used to be freebies on airlines, it comes to us. Um, oftentimes directly from the employee, more frequently now it's coming from the children of employees, but we're still pleased to get it because we characterize our collection two ways. One, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Nobody has all the pieces, so we are glad to take everything. We'll sort through it and find maybe that one piece we need that fills a gap that we have or leads us into another dark closet full of things that we didn't know of the history of the airline. Um, the other analogy I like to give is we look like a museum. We operate like a museum. We're a 501c3. We have a good relationship with the Minnesota Historical Society, with, the, with Delta's uh, Aviation Museum, with several others around the country. Um, but we're kind of like that wheel of cheese. And the specific cheese I think of is Swiss cheese. We look good from the distance, but you get up close. We have a lot of holes in our collection. So again, everything that we're offered we graciously accept because it just might fill in one of those holes. So what are we? Well, we are Bloomington's diamond in the rough. We're the aviation museum you didn't know was in your backyard. Uh, we are currently located over on 34th Avenue South, uh, the South Loop area now as it's called. We opened in October of 2002. It was a one-man vision. Uh, a, a former employee named Pete Paskey didn't like the fact there was no museum. Nothing honored the heritage of Northwest Airlines, the groundbreaking that they did in pioneering aviation in, in what the rest of the country considered hinterland, and my brother-in-law considers flyover land. Um, 
and he was the guiding force behind getting the support necessary to open the museum. Uh, it helped that he was also an officer of the uh, Northwest Airline Employee Credit Union, so coincidentally it opened in the lower level of the Northwest Employee Credit Union base, uh, building. It all worked for us. We are completely volunteer. We are former employees and friends of the airline, nuts, history nuts, airplane nuts, plane nuts, um, everything. But there, are, last year, 40 of us put in over 6,100 hours of volunteer time to keeping the museum open. When we were in the Wings building, um, we had marginally better visibility, and we were open 300 days a year. We closed for two months in 2015 while we, we moved, and we've moved to a place that has little less visibility and difficult parking, so our attendance uh, has dropped to a fraction of what it used to be, and we've scaled back the hours just to utilize the volunteer strength that we have better. But we, we in, most of our visitors, it seems now, are group homes that come down. Um, they hear about us through various publications. They call and schedule an appointment, let us know how many they're coming with. We muster up the volunteers and we're very happy to see them come in, explain the history of what was one of North or Minnesota's greatest gems and tell them stories. We, for a small museum, we've been very active. Uh, we participated in uh, the latest version of Lost Twin Cities. There was a snippet on Northwest Airlines, so we were, we were a film studio for one day. That was interesting and, and an interesting experience. We, do, we have one event a year at the what is now the uh, Best Western Plus on the south side of the Mall of America. And we have an annual airline collectible show and sale. And what we do is we bring in vendors from out of state or within state. And basically it's just an opportunity for the museum to sell surplus items with the, res uh, the proceeds benefiting the museum. For other collectors, hoarders, and people that have airline things to dispose of them or swap trade or go home with more of them as the case may be. But what are we going to do? We're faced with uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, our location, I can't say enough about Rice Real Estate, who is our landlord. They've been very generous in helping us stay where we're at. But we have a visibility issue, which translates to a traffic issue, which translates to a support issue. And we, have as the board, have sat and figured out, well, what are we going to do? Well, the Minnesota Air National Guard has been the driving force behind having a Minnesota Air and Space Museum. Uh, they have a large collection of airplanes. Any of you that prior to 20 or, uh, 2001, 9-11, may have been able to freely walk in and see is now on an active base, and it's basically been out of the public's reach since 9-11. But they've been the driving force behind this effort called Airspace Minnesota, and it's gone through several versions to the current one right now. And what they're doing is they have got the commitment of all of the communities at the upper post at Fort Snelling, and I didn't know there are 16 entities who have a, a say of one size or another in what goes on up at the upper post there. But the golf course up there, that small nine-hole executive course, has been earmarked, I believe it's 16 or 22 acres, as a future home for Airspace Minnesota. All Airspace Minnesota has to do is raise $100 million to build the facility, but all the NWA History Center has to do is hang on for the seven to ten years it's forecasted, and then we can move in there and I can retire and breathe a sigh of relief and just be a normal volunteer. But this is where <clears throat> Excuse me, this is, this is the wagon we've hitched ourselves to. And while it's not Bloomington, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, um, Fort Snelling, the zip code says it's Minneapolis, or excuse me, the zip code says it's St. Paul, the location says it's Minneapolis. From where 
it is, you can see, Bloomington, Richfield, St. Paul. So I like to say it has kind of a, it, it's kind of a central location for all the areas around MSP that were home for Northwest Airlines and Republic and North Central. So we're, this is where we want to be in seven to 10 years, sooner the better, frankly. So how can you help us get there? Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you, come and visit us. Um, it's really discouraging to the volunteers to, to pull, they pull three hour shifts. Um, it's really discouraging not to have anybody come down and utilize their knowledge or listen to their stories or you wouldn't know if they invented one anyway but it would be entertaining and there'd be a gem of a historical basis for it but do come visit us and bring your friends we you know that is the purpose of the museum we're sitting on 84 years of history that we're trying to get organized but it's fun to tell other people about it it's no fun to have a secret like that it's just eating us up um, so we ask you to come and visit us we encourage you to become a member and support us. There are copies of your member benefit, which primarily is the newsletter that we publish four times a year. And you also get a 10% discount at the gift store in the museum. But it's just a fun place to learn a little bit more about how important the areas, the communities around MSP were and are. I mean, it, it's amazing. I started in 79. How many employees lived in Bloomington? They tell me, yeah, I, I hired on with Northwest right after the war, the big one. And I bought a house. It cost me $15,000, and I didn't know how I was going to pay the mortgage on that. And I look at them, and I go, oh, man. I blame my parents. They, were, they married late. I was born late, much like you. You know, it's just timing is everything. Uh, but uh, it's, it's interesting to hear these stories, and these all evaporate over time. I mean, we're all part of some company or some community, and we're all transient. We, we're not going to be here forever. Some last longer than others, the companies, I mean. And so it's important to, to have these histories because they do serve as an encouragement for other younger generations that, well, look, yeah, no, 2008 is not 1948, but there are similarities, there are still some opportunities and stumbling blocks that were in effect then or prevented or helped you then that can prevent or help you now. There's things to be learned from history, so I'm a, I'm a keen advocate that history matters. So the other thing I want to ask is what can you do as a community to help us I mean you know the 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 top ones they're all kind of we just want you to come and see what we've got so that you can go out and tell your associates your friends you know on a rainy afternoon day afternoon come on over but the other thing is we want to be more of a community asset um, we feel we are we do a lot but we know we're just kind of scratching the surface on this that each of you has your own circle of businesses, associates, and all that. And together, it's kind of like bricks in a wall. Individually, it's a brick. It might hold the door open and keep the papers down. But you put a bunch of us together, and we can build a structure. And we want to be part of that structure. So you know, as a sense of community, I really appreciate what the Rotarians do. I'm really pleased that, as I say, as Jim acknowledged, I'll give him credit. He hauled us out. He hauled me out of my little shell, and and it's just a great opportunity to see some sunshine, see some new faces, and and tell you that you know we are part of a very vibrant community around the airport. So, uh, oh, I do have one more slide. I do believe. Oh, yes, the important information. We up until we cut up until we moved. Our bragging point was we were open more hours than the Minnesota Historical Society. We were open six days a week. They, they were only open five. So that was our bragging rights. That's over with now. But we'd love to see you down there. We're open Tuesday through Fridays, 11 to 5, Saturdays from 9 to 1. Um, you know, if you have a special event, we've hosted uh, lectures there. We've actually had a couple of memorial services. We've done book launches there. Jack Elhai, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but he 
two years ago now, wrote a book called uh, On the History of Northwest Airlines. Um, boy, senior moment, but uh, Turbulent Skies, I believe it was. And it was actually a good history of Northwest um, because it wasn't a corporate history. It was uh, day to day. So you got the good, the bad, the board uh, view the individual, the employee's view. It was very good on, on, in, in that respect. You can visit us online. We have a website. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, our newspaper editor handles the social media. I understand it's a gab fest, but I just have too much going on to sit there and, and chit and chat. So I, I kind of, oh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. So are there any questions? Uh, are, are there any stories you want to tell or anybody? Uh, Sir Jim. In this, in this brochure that's on the table, Northwest History Center, it talks about an impressive list of firsts. You know, and uh, you didn't really mention any of these, but it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, the number of things that were started by Northwest by Airlines. Airlines. You know, we all think of Northwest Orient because yes. first flights between the United States and Tokyo, July 1947. Yeah. First airline to offer coast to coast air coach service in 1949. First airline to ban smoking yep. in 1988. Uh, first airline to uh, offer seat back entertainment systems to passengers. I think that was usually the person in front, they're three, three month old, they just, you know. <laughs> but, and then, this Northwest Airline pilot, Captain Bob, is credited with developing and commercializing a roller wheel suitcase, now used by just about everybody in the world. It is. I, I don't know if any of you traveled, well, even into the 80s. Remember, you'd have that separate rack that you would lash your luggage to, and so you had two pieces that you had to account for. Yeah, he was a, a pilot. I believe he lives in Bloomington, I believe, or else Egan, I'm not sure, somewhere in the metro area. Unbelievable that something that ubiquitous, and it, it came again from Minnesota. So, yeah. The one I like, though, is you go back to 1926, and um, Northwest started with two rented airplanes. Well, they were just hauling mail. They realized, uh, Colonel Britton realized that's not the future, um, depending on a postal subsidy to for a business plan. We gotta haul people. So he went out and he bought the first three purpose-built cabin airplanes for passengers and inaugurated that in February of 1927. So the first guy that flew on, uh, from Minneapolis to uh, Chicago, he wasn't sitting on top of mail bags, he wasn't in an open cockpit airplane, he was actually sitting in a a real, it looks like, I've, I've seen interior pictures, it looks like a car. The, it was a bench seat in the back that two people could sit in, and then somebody sat next to the pilot. And I don't know if, I don't think they had a throw over yoke where if something happened to the pilot, it's all yours. <laughs> but it was a big improvement over what the other airlines were doing at the time. And one of the reasons both um, Dickinson and Britain got Cam 9 unopposed is winter scared the heck out of most of the other people in the country. They were, you know, they believed what they read, I suppose, that, you know, this was a frozen wasteland. Well, it, it's frozen, yes, but only six months out of the year. But they always thought that the mountains were higher, and it turns out they're not. They're actually easier to, to traverse than they are further south. So, you know, it, it, nobody bothered them. It was really interesting. And in 1945, Northwest became the fourth transcontinental airline. Um, TWA, United, and American were already. And in 1945, Northwest was, and they served the upper Midwest all the way out to Seattle. Yes, sir. You have connected with the Bloomington Historical Society. They have a number of Northwest. Yes, they do. Uh, Vonda and oh, yeah. Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Would you speak to, because they have a beautiful picture of Speed Holden. Talk a little bit about Speed. Well, a Bloomington native. Um, I understand he did not like the term Speed. That was bestowed upon him by the press, but, you know, uh, 
I'm sure Colonel Britton probably thought there's no such thing as bad ink either. So, um, but he's an interesting individual. Um, I, I'm going to confess my bias. I, I'm working on a biography of a Hastings native who did virtually the same thing, but he went out to Spokane, and he was a contemporary of Holman's up until Speed died, Charles died in 1932 in o Omaha. But Holman had a very, uh, I, I, he was known for his aviation exploits. Um, I think he was a good salesman. He, he certainly seemed to have gotten along he made a good impression. He, he talked to people well. He instilled confidence. Um, it, again, it didn't hurt some of the uh, aerobatics that he would do. I've never met the man, obviously. I've never, there's not much written that I can find about him describing his personality or anything. Uh, one story I did here, and it's not to be negative, it's just because there's so much about people in history we don't know now that he was demonstrating a plane to a prospective buyer. Now, back in the 20s, Northwest, in addition to flying the mail and packages and all that, they operated a flying school, and they would teach ground school all the way through pilot's license, and they flew a Waco biplane. I don't know if it was a Waco or what, but he had a prospective buyer in the cockpit with him, and he proceeded to show him what this Waco would do. He just, in, in aeronautics, he rang it out. He, he did everything, he, loops, corkscrews, everything. Lost the sale. Poor guy, the, the guy in back was not quite that adventuresome. So it didn't work out in that respect. But, you know, he had, an, an, he had a great career with Northwest. He was Britain's go-to man for route development up again up until the time of his death he died in uh, a national air race in omaha in 1932 he held numerous speed records um i mean i'd like to have gone out and had a drink with the guy frankly <laughs> fly with i don't know but uh drink certainly i imagine he had some good stories but again another bloomington resident and uh joe kim is another one well he, he was Richfield, but again, I, I, I consider the whole area around the airport to be community. But Joe Kim was another pilot for Northwest. He actually started as a steward when he was 19 years old, worked his way up when he retired in the uh, 70s. He was a 747 captain. What, what a career that must have been from nothing to that. But he became the mayor of Richfield for a while. So it's just interesting how the people in the community, worked in the community, but also contributed to the community. So Bruce, are you able to stay uh, there? Absolutely. Have? Absolutely. Would love to. And again, thank you very much thank for the invitation. So <laughs> and Bruce, Bruce, in appreciation, you need to come back for a minute. So in appreciation for your speaking presentation today, a donation to NPolio will be made in your name to NPolio Now, which is the signature project of Rotary International. In the early 1980s, there are 400,000 cases of polio in the world each year, and Rotary decided to join with other organizations to lead the eradication of polio. We are so close to eradicating this devastating disease. This year, we've had nine cases. Um, so in 2016, we've had nine cases in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And at this time last year, we had 22 cases. So we're on the, we're, we're closing in to the eradication. So success over polio will help fuel the energy of what people of the world can do when we work together. And so I would like to give you, here is a certificate. And here is a, a rotary and a pen for you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.